We've got a special guest in the studio with us today. We're going to be talking about some upcoming research that we're doing and also just talking about how to add some variety to your career to keep going. Welcome to the Leading Edge in Emotionally Focused Therapy with your hosts, Dr. James Hawkins and Dr. Ryan Reyna. EFT is a dynamic model that humbles even the most seasoned therapists. Together, we want to come alongside you as you continually push the leading edge of your understanding and application of this wonderful model developed by Dr. Sue Johnson. Yes, indeed. It is my honor and privilege to have a guest in the studio with me today. You've actually heard her on this podcast before. It, uh, right now, I know Julia doesn't like any of this, but it is none other than the Dr. Julia Conroy. Let's welcome her to the podcast today. All right. All right. <laughs> <laughs> no, nah, but just seriously, Julia, thank you for everything that you do in Arkansas EFT. And, and really, I appreciate even we're going to talk about this some more, but even hearing your heart for the EFT world at large. Um, you know, we've got to have you on here before and we talked about your research from your dissertation. And now we get to talk a little bit more about, you know, carrying that forward and mm. some of the big things from that. So thank you again. Yeah. Oh, I'm so excited to be here. I'm such a fan of the work that you and Ryan do through the podcast mm -hmm. um, and obviously of the EFT model. And I do. I think the research that we're talking about today um, has impacted my own life personally. Um, and it also I've, I've seen the ripple effects in my clients' lives. And I just have this passion of how do we study this process so that we can teach it more effectively, so that it can be administered more effectively um, in the counseling session itself. Um, so I'm really excited to share about that today. All right. So once again, Dr. Conroy has been on here. I, I did not look up the episode <laughs> number. I should have done that. Uh, but just talking about some of her research mm -hmm. about looking at emotional synchrony in the mm -hmm. EFT process. But now, what are some of the big things you're looking forward to in this new research? Uh, yeah. Yeah, I'm excited. So I'm sure everyone has it memorized by heart. Um, <laughs> but the research that we did before um, basically had uh, two, both the cup members of the couple um, that we were studying were wearing uh, wristbands that studied heart rate, um, electrodermal activity, basically different stress levels. Mm -hmm. um, and we found that over the process of EFT, um, that there was more synchrony that was developed, especially um, under um, the sessions that were more focused on emotional level processing, the cognitive work. Actually, mm -hmm. there was kind of a lack of synchrony that took place as there was just some organization mm -hmm. um, of the clinician. But as we got to, into that deeper order processing, that's when we started to see their heart rate synchronize. Wow. Um, which was really cool to see. That actually in vulnerability is mm -hmm. when they begin to synchronize. Yes, which and there was like a lagged synchrony, um, which basically means, you know, when one partner kind of shot up um, and started to feel that stress, usually the partner that was processing or sharing, and then we saw the other partner join them Whoa. Um, with a, a lagged time, usually about a, a second or two behind them um, to join them there, which was really powerful to I see. even like that phrase, join them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it makes sense that there's a lag because one person has to move into the vulnerability, exactly. which then sends a signal out to invite the other person to join with them. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. And, and over time, we got to see that happen more and more. Um, so we are going to be doing some of the same okay. um, in this research project that we're launching. And we are also throwing um, a third wristband into the mix that will be on our clinician. Ooh. That's right. That's right. So you're going to be checking my biometrics <laughs> as well. In the midst of this. That's right. That's right. There's no getting away from it now because <laughs> I'm sure we've all got suspicions, right? I've got the sweat stains to prove it after my <laughs> most intense counseling sessions. Um, but we're going to kind of be putting numbers to that and seeing what over time, what do we see on the synchrony between e uh, clients um, themselves as a couple, between client and therapist, um, between both of those relationships, Whoa. Um, just to see kind of what impact that has overall. I really am excited. to. I mean, it, 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 I can feel the vulnerability yeah. in this research design, <laughs> but I'm like, I'm going to get better at the end of this. Yeah, okay. yeah. and it does. It, it gives us insight too. even 
what happens in my body and and especially we'll, we'll get into this some more i'm sure but we're also looking to record these sessions so that we'll be able to go back to these time stamps mm-hmm. especially when we see maybe a spike in the therapist Ooh. and say okay what what intervention did i reach for you know, whenever I noticed I got blocked in a big way or I noticed myself getting dysregulated, maybe I reach more for psycho ed. Um, maybe I try to organize or I exit the process that I'm on that we're going to really try to break that down just to build some awareness around, okay, here are some moves um, that that are t- common to reach for that can disrupt the process, mm-hmm. right? And that's okay, but how do we kind of enter back in if we can generate some awareness around that? That's kind of our hope. Um, around tracking the the therapist physiology as well. That I'm excited. Talk about some real time self of the therapist <sighs> research. Yeah. <laughs> Whoa. Like what happens to my body? What do mm. I tend to go for? And then am I able to like get back into the process? And like, yes. Okay. And I do. I hope it ultimately that it's just so validating <laughs> um, for all the work that we do um, mm. over the course of one session and the ways that we ride those emotional um, experiences with our clients. Um, that we're going to be able to see evidence of that as well that we're really excited about. Wow, I just just clicked in my mind. We're mm-hmm. also going to see session flow in real time. Yes, yeah. You know, we've l- learned from Brent Bradley and, J- and Jim Farrell's mm-hmm. research about mm-hmm. like that 21 minutes to get kind of viable yes. emotion, 38 yes. minutes, they kind of hit a knot. Mm-hmm. Okay, we're going to see that in real time. Yes, yeah, and just kind of see what does that look like with regard to heart rate? What does that look like with regard to, you know, electrodermal activity? Um that hopefully it'll provide some insight. Electrodermal activity. <laughs> I like this. This is great. Electrodermal. Okay. I'm going to have some big words on this podcast. After. <laughs> this is great. This That's is great. That's right. What about your dictionaries? Here That's we right. go. <laughs> and maybe this is a preemptive question, but just thinking about, you know, at the end of this, how do you, I guess maybe you've already answered it, but just thinking for our listeners, how do you hope this will impact maybe the counseling world, the EFT yeah. world? That I do. I hope. Um, I think something that's really cool about uh, the the clinic where we're administering this research is we're asking kind of a clinicians from a wide range of experience um, to to um, to join us in this process. And I think part of that is to say, okay, a more experienced therapist when they get dysregulated, this is how they tend to ground themselves. Mm-hmm. This is what they do during session, right? Where maybe a more novice therapist, these are kind of their go-to moves. Mm-hmm. Um, and that what that will do maybe that's been taught through experience. Maybe that's just a natural disposition that the therapist has. But if we can kind of put words to that, we can help teach those things to help um, clinicians to stay more grounded because it's inevitable that we're going to get dysregulated in session. And I hope that this provides more clarity on ways to ground yourself so that you can be, um, yeah, just more present, more engaged in the process. Man, we're going to have a lot. Yeah, this is this is exciting to me. It really is, yeah. Julia. Thank you for bringing that uh, to this area. I really appreciate that. Yeah, it's yeah. going to be exciting. Another piece I'm super excited about that I, I personally – Um, just have a lot of curiosity around um, is the client's perception of Mm. the counseling process itself and specifically around this idea of attunement. Um, Because I think I walk out of a session, I'm like, man, I made that crystal clear and that was so great and like I really got it. And then sometimes I'm like, wow, I just really muddled that. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, But I find just because I'm having some clarity on, okay, this is the step that we're on. This is, you know, where I am in the tango. This is what I'm trying, even if I'm really on mission, that may not correlate with my clients really understanding of why they're there. There we go. And so another piece of this research is we're going to be administering client surveys at the end of session, just gauging, okay, what what do you feel like the purpose of you being here is, right? Does it feel like you know why you're here? Does it feel like that's more clear? What does it feel like your therapist is trying to do? Um, And then we're also going to ask them, like, scale of 1 to 10, how well does it feel like your therapist really understood your experience today? Um, Because I can feel like I'm really attuned and, like, I'm really getting their experience. And and they may not feel that way. Um, And maybe they're too nervous to say something. Maybe... um, you know, they, they don't totally feel clear in themselves. And so it's hard to know if you're clear. Um, and so that's another thing that we're going to be looking at client perception of the counseling process itself, and Mm -hmm. then how well they feel attuned to in the process. Well, there's a lot to learn here. Yeah. 
Wow. Yeah. Okay. Well, I want to keep talking with you on this, not only on the big points from the research, but also just getting into a little bit like you've been doing this counseling thing for a while. And so we're just going to talk about also keeping your career fresh. And even why mm -hmm. did this research come about after this break? It's an honor for Ryan and I to get to come to you on these airwaves, to meet you where you are, with you and your clients who are pushing the leading edge in your clinical work. And we're thankful for this opportunity and for the work that you do. And we want to invite you that if you believe in the concepts of this podcast and you find them helpful, as we do, uh, we just invite you to be able to invest and to help keep this mission and this project going. You can support us by going on Venmo and looking for at left podcast that's at l-e-f-t p-o-d-c-a-s-t left podcast and you can show your support once again if you yourself are in a hard position or you serve uh maybe um less resource population and therefore affects your fees please don't worry about giving just continue to enjoy but if you can we invite you to help support this mission and keep it going thank you so much and also just want to help advertise and just, you know, advocate for support for ICEF. ICEF is the International Center for Excellence in Emotionally Focused Therapy. And just really appreciate the work that ICEF is doing to take this dynamic model developed by Dr. Sue Johnson um, and help break it out into these three modalities. Uh, but there's great reasons to be a member of ICEF. One, you hear about some of the cutting edge research that is also on their website. You, you stay abreast of all the counseling um, that counseling, that the training opportunities that are coming up. And as members on some of those uh, training opportunities and training DVDs, you can get a discount. And it just helps connect you to the broader professional community of EFT therapists who are helping couples, individuals, and families around the world. Thank you so much. All right, Julia. <clears throat> so the one, I'm excited about the research and just what's going to come. I'm sure it's going to, part of that's going to show up here on this podcast. I'm thinking about self of the therapist training. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm thinking about me as a trainer getting refined and even more new, like um, clear. And when mm -hmm. I do go to the trainings, mm -hmm. like this is what I'm seeing kind of from advanced yes. EFT therapists, kind of in the middle of their career therapists mm -hmm. and new therapists. Because mm -hmm. I think I'll, I'll, as a trainer, I'm going to learn from some of our new yeah. people on what, what they're doing. I'm like, mm -hmm. oh, I never looked at it like that because mm -hmm. they're going to give me fresh perspective mm -hmm. as well. And there might be some things where I just got set in my ways and I keep running into the same stuck spot and don't even realize I'm doing it. So anywho, I'm excited about that, but also kind of helped me like you were talking before we got on, like about also why did this research for you kind of show up, you know, in this way? Yeah, I think something that feels really important to me and what has always kind of drawn me to research is. I think in my graduate school experience, I just heard a lot about kind of protecting yourself against burnout mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and how uh, how easy it is to hit that point, right? That we're really isolated in yeah. this field. Um, it's easy to just kind of, even though we're hearing different things every day, like and every client's story is different and needs to be honored like that, that's draining. And when you're doing that in an isolated way, when you're doing that time after time, when there's kind of maybe a rut, even like you said, that I can get into where there's not this novelty or, or something that's exciting, mm -hmm. that can just be a really dangerous place for clinicians to get into, mm -hmm. um, just with regard to self-care and, and their ability to provide excellent care um, in the ways that they intend to. And so I think from uh, the beginning of my career, I always wanted to think about, okay, what's something new I wanna be doing? What's something exciting? Um, that I want to have on the horizon. And I just feel like um, a research project like this just opens up limitless possibilities of new questions, of new things to look into, of how to better understand this, how to better communicate the skills um, that we're doing in session, how to better communicate to our clients what we're doing, mm -hmm. um, that it just is so much unexplored, uncharted territory that's really exciting for me um, and offers all this opportunity for, for change in how we teach these things or how we can supervise more effectively. Um, that that just really is what's exciting to me is it's something new um, and that 
even after thinking about this research, I haven't gone into session the same way, um, just in kind of conceptualizing what we want to do. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I've tried to be more clear with my clients, and it, and it just gives my brain um, something new to kind of chew over and, and spin over mm -hmm. um, that makes it exciting and, and kind of fresh to come into work, if that makes sense. No, that makes a lot of sense. I wish I could see Julia's face in the studio. <laughs> like, it's just sheer joy and excitement. And I think you, that you're right about that, about being able to find, like, even in your career, like, I appreciate all of our listeners, you know, part of the motivation is we're all trying to push to find our leading edge. Mm -hmm. And by the way, everyone, mm -hmm. I don't care, you know, as much as people think nice things about me and my clinical skills, which I believe in. <laughs> But I'm like, hey, everyone has a leading edge. Yeah. Um, and that what that means is I think it does do something to say, hey, I want to learn something new. Mm -hmm. I want to get better at something. Mm -hmm. And to have like those focus sometimes helps make it where yes. I'm just trying to treat my career like mm -hmm. it's just one big thing that mm -hmm. I get through day by day, mm -hmm. session by session, mm -hmm. week by week. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like that. Well, and I do. I feel like our grad school experience is like, okay, let me get through classes. Okay, now I've got my clinical experience. Mm -hmm. Okay, now I've got like preliminary licensure. Okay, now I got to pass this test. Now I got to go for full licensure. And then it's like, okay, I'm I'm out of checkpoints. Like <laughs> now I can just go? Like what what am I reaching for next? Like should I become a supervisor after a while? Should I move to some sort of like different role like it should I go back to school like it's just it's confusing yeah right because we're never just given this like okay what are you genuine genuinely curious about um I had a professor mm. in grad school that talked about um chasing your curiosities um and that phrase just really stuck with me of like what are you curious about like what kind of lights a fire um under you with this field and how can you make that something tangible and, and tactile and something that you can kind of move forward with because it's that level of excitement that something that makes me want to chase after it, like it. <laughs> right is what's going to make me excited and be um, and keep my career sustainable over time um, and I think it's just important um, for us to be talking about how we do that individually of how we do that collectively mm. um, it helps us feel less alone it helps us get excited about what we're doing and I think the biggest thing that that done, has done for me is it reminds me of what an honor it is to do what we do. Mm. And I think it can just be so easy to be like, okay, just five left today. Okay, like just two more sessions and then like it's dinner time, you know, yeah. or whatever it is. Like we all have those days. Um, but if I can have the next thing that I'm like really excited about that makes me look at things differently, that mm -hmm. challenges me in this way, that pushes me to be better, that I can see and feel that growth inside me, that just changes the way we can come into work. Wow. Man, Julie, thank you. You know, um, you know, I know this is a little bit different for our podcast, but I think there's this is such an important part, which mm -hmm. is why I'm glad you wanted to talk about this mm -hmm. as well. Yeah. Is like, what is it that you need as to care for your heart as a clinician to help mm -hmm. keep you in the game? Yeah. 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 Oh, it's it's definitely true. And I do. I think that that's something that ICEF does really well, like as mm -hmm. a structure, is it just provides so many growth opportunities. Um, and as somebody that was I, I have been certified in the last year and somebody asked, like, so the clients like know that you're certified like does it <laughs> <laughs> what like do they seek you out because you're certified I'm like no most of my clients have no idea what like EFT really is but they can tell you what's happening in session <laughs> right like they haven't studied the model they they may not even know who Sue Johnson is but they see they felt the power of her work in session mm -hmm. right without having this like explicit direct knowledge of it but what certification has done for me, right, is it gave me something to be excited about. Like writing the transcripts, it was like, man, I say this a lot, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Or like, yeah. wow, I could really use conjecture more effectively if I had done this. Yeah. Um, and I think that ISEP just does such a good job of encouraging and, and pushing clinicians to say, okay, what is your leading edge? Here's the next thing. Here's the next training here's the next way to consider how to to grow and move forward mm -hmm. in your skill set which i just think is so valuable um for the field as a whole wow that's that's you, you there's so many ideas going in my head but i really appreciate hearing how like excited you are mm -hmm. 
to uh, to allow yourself to be pushed, you're really inviting that you like it actually invigorates you as Dr. Yeah. Conroy to say, what's another way I can get better? Yeah. Yeah, and I want to give permission. There are seasons where it's like, you know what, I'm tapped out, and like yeah, that's right. showing up is okay. That's right, exactly. <laughs> and that's like what I need to do. But it, it's fun to have that, like, you know what? But when I do have more capacity, that's right. or when I do have the bandwidth, like this is where I see myself going next. Or sometimes that's what burnout is. Burnout is just saying, like, hey, maybe it's try to try time to try something different. Or, yes. Or yeah. get better, or have a nuance on something. Yes. Okay. I think that that's perfectly said. Okay. And I agree with you on the ISF part. And what I want to make sure I encourage with that is, one, that's being a part of your local EFT mm -hmm. community. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's great to, like, let your local EFT community know about specialties you have. Yeah. Because then, you you know, you might they might want to say, well, could you lead a peer-to-peer -peer group on yeah. that discussion? Mm -hmm. And sometimes we as clinicians, it's not even about, I think that's just something stimulating. It's another gift we get to give as people who have trained to be helpers mm -hmm. is to take the knowledge and wisdom we've gained as helpers to mm -hmm. share with either our peers or mm -hmm. with the general public mm -hmm. um, are some ways. Um, also within that is just having that relationship of, I remember when I was trying to get certified, mm -hmm. it was me and like five to six other therapists who said like, hey, let's all support each other mm -hmm. and encourage each other. Wow. Um, and that definitely helped, helped me out in my career. Yeah. Um, I do see a lot of EFT therapists that keep going to training mm -hmm. or they volunteer mm -hmm. um, to help keep some of the costs down. You know, yes, yeah. Julia kind of helps run that part of our program here mm -hmm. in Arkansas. Mm -hmm. Like she has like the pool of volunteers and who's oh. went, you know, and all that. Yeah. But for many of them, it's it's reinvigorating for their career. So they'll donate their time and mm -hmm. energy because they say it kind of helps keeps them sharp and motivated. Mm -hmm. So you can look into those in your local EFT community. Mm -hmm. um, just so many ways, so, so many ways. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, and just getting creative with that, which can be hard to do. Like mm -hmm. it's a lot of effort that a lot of us don't have, you know, a ton of extra time on our hands. Yeah. <laughs> but I see it kind of as an investment yeah. in my career. If I can put a little extra time in to do the things I love, like that's going to be so much payout in the future. And maybe you said like, it sounds like two nerds are talking. All the, <laughs> but I want to, I think even you've done this outside of work. You found challenges outside of work that push you, whether, mm -hmm. you know, fitness goals mm -hmm. and things mm -hmm. like that. Or I've seen other EFT therapists, you know, that I've, a couple I've met that are, are taking Argentinian tango themselves. <laughs> They're really awesome. embodying the Sue Johnson thing, right? <laughs> yeah. You know, um, but also it's just those other ways. And mm -hmm. many of our listeners here, like I got to hang out and I'm giving them a shout out again in Alaska mm -hmm. and meeting some of them like, oh, I, I listen to you while I'm on this trail and taking in beauty mm -hmm. or working on this goal or wow. kind of thing. So anyway, wow. you know, That's I think awesome. that is an important thing is like what's helping you not just push your leading edge as like, mm -hmm. you know, getting better at therapeutically, mm -hmm. but what's pushing your leading edge as like a person mm -hmm. to help kind of keep your heart and your mind yeah. in this game of therapy or mm. this profession of therapy. Yeah. Right? And I do, I think even how that fits into the model, right. Is that the, that's the point and that's the goal that like we're trying to get our clients mm -hmm. to, can they feel the base of their secure connection, mm. right? And, and that that's stability enough where they're able to go and to reach out, right? And that even talks, like taps into Bulby's original attachment theory. It's safe to explore, right. right? And try these new things and grow in these ways because I have this safety and stability, right, of, of kind of what I've built. Mm -hmm. So I'm free to explore and, and just have fun with these things. Um, and that's what, what keeps us in the game. Man, thanks. I think if you're like a maybe if you're a new clinician and you're listening today or maybe you're just tapped out in life, <laughs> it's great to know, like hold right now where yeah, you are. If yes. you're that new clinician, you've got a lot of basic stuff to take <laughs> care of anyway. But, you know, maybe it is a time in your career or in life to think about like, hey, is there something else cool that I could do mm -hmm. with this, you know, to help keep me afresh? Maybe it's study a new area. Maybe it's like there was a time when. I really tried to look into trauma work some mm -hmm. more and read up on that. Yeah. I think right now it's switching to a little bit to some of the neurodiversity mm -hmm. stuff because it's coming in my office. Oh, yeah. But that even in this research project, these are all things where I feel like, man, this is, especially for me going into the winter and fall months, my mood goes down. <laughs> so it's good that I've kind of got these research things yeah. to look forward to yes. uh, coming up for the fall. So, But maybe for you, just thinking about like, What's something I could try? Mm -hmm. You know, if, you know, like uh, like you just talked about, you know, Bowley's five systems. Mm -hmm. You know, what's another way I could think about the world at large mm -hmm. or to help me kind of have a new invigoration in this profession? Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Yeah, that it's protective for you in that way, and it's good for your clients. It's good for the like just personal relationships too. Man. Like, there's just so many ripple effects from that. Man, Dr. Conroy, thank you so much. And of course, you'll probably have to be back on. I guess maybe next fall we'll have the research <laughs> back in. Maybe we'll have it somewhat <laughs> analyzed, <Yeah. laughs> and we'll be talking about some of the findings that are coming out. Yeah. So, just well, excited. We are. We're really excited. Thank you for having me on, James. It's always fun to get to talk about. Um, all of our nerdy things. <laughs> <laughs> there you go, y'all. Continue pushing your leading edge, y'all. Thank you so much. Thank you for listening. We hope this experience helps you push the leading edge in your work to help people connect with themselves and with each other. Please subscribe to our podcast and leave us a five-star review. You can contact us at pushtheleadingedge at gmail.com. And you can follow us on our Facebook page at Push the Leading Edge. You can follow Ryan on Facebook at Ryan Rayner Professional Training and on his website, RyanRaynerTraining.com. You can follow James on Facebook and Instagram at DocHawkLPC. You can also check out his website, DocHawkLPC.com. Mm-hmm.